Okay, now it's ready. So, Tim Bird, please go ahead. Okay, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, speak at the meeting uh, this morning. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of an update on the status of Embedded Linux and the Embedded Linux community. Uh, my name is Tim Bird, and I am a senior staff software engineer at Sony Electronics. I'm also uh, involved a lot with the Linux Foundation. I'm on the technical advisory board and involved uh, with a few of their initiatives. Uh, particularly the uh, core embedded uh, Linux project. Um, and anyway, we'll go ahead and uh, go through this. So, um, just wanted to uh, introduce the nature of this talk. Some of you have probably seen this talk uh, a lot. <laughs> I, I give it uh, fairly often. Uh, but just to introduce people who have not seen this talk before, this is a quick overview of lots of different embedded topics. Uh, it's not really intended to be comprehensive. Um, it's just kind of a survey of uh, different areas, uh, kind of interesting thing, particularly interesting things that have happened recently. Uh, so uh, in this particular talk, um, I'm going to go over stuff that happened in the last two or three months. Uh, other versions of the talk, sometimes I cover a whole year. Uh, basically, this is intended to be a springboard for further research. So basically, just to show, uh, give you. Uh, exposure to some interesting things uh, you may not have heard about. Uh, so, and I have an awful lot of links in the presentation. So, if you see something interesting, uh, you have a link uh, that you can search for, or you have a phrase you can Google uh, to go look up more information about this. Um, so, with that uh, out of the way, uh, this is kind of a major overview. I'm going to talk about several different uh, open source software areas. Uh, and that will include operating systems, different operating systems. Uh, in the past, I've historically focused uh, pretty heavily on the Linux kernel, but I'm, uh, I, for this talk, I actually included a couple other kernels that I think are interesting. I'll go through technology areas that are being used and embedded, some of the things that are uh, go going on, and then talk about some of the conferences, especially a few that we've had recently, and uh, look, look ahead to some of the ones that are coming up and give some industry news and uh, then point you to some resources. So uh, let's get right into it with OSS areas. So uh, again, I'm going to talk about operating systems, uh, including Linux, and then go through a bunch of technology areas. And if you've seen my presentation before, uh, you'll notice that this is a quite a different list that I'm, that I usually do. I'll probably st start alternating this uh, uh, so that I have kind of a more technical kernel focused talk, and then this one is kind of less uh, less kernel focused, uh, talking about languages and testing and and the web and, and stuff like that. That's not really uh, uh, not really about kernel technology or code per se. But in any event, let me start with operating systems. So there's a whole bunch of different open source operating systems that are being used. Uh, and uh, I'll cover, this is, list is by no means exhaustive. Uh, there are proprietary ones, there are, there are other open source ones. Uh, but this is, uh, there's, here's a lot of different operating systems. So let me just talk about some of these. So NetX uh, is kind of interesting. Uh, they're working on their first ever conference, uh, the NetX community. Uh, it's uh, slated for July 16th and 17th in the Netherlands. <clears throat> and. Uh, this is being sponsored by a company called Technolution, and actually there's been discussion about this for probably over a year. Uh, some other parties tried to get involved and, and start something up. I'll note that Sony and NXP are involved in this. Uh, uh, we don't know exactly the level of involvement, uh, but uh, pretty sure that we'll have someone there presenting, and I actually think uh, Ishikawa-san is going to talk about that maybe later. Uh, but we uh, expect about 70 attendees and possibly more for, a, for the private part of the event or for the attendee specific part. And there might be a reception with other attendees uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, so that's actually really good. Uh, it, I was looking at, uh, for some of the research I was doing for this talk, I was looking at uh, FreeRTOS. And uh, they seem to have a pretty good, well-developed community. Uh, 
and quite a bit more promotion than NetX has had. So I think this is kind of the first steps of some groups and organizations trying to do some promotion and building up of the uh, ecosystem. So I think this is a really good thing. Um, and so we'll have to see. I know that uh, some of the, uh, if you want to call it the famous people in NetX are going to be at this conference. Maybe all of the famous people in NetX, I don't know. Uh, but Greg is going to be there, and uh, so I think this will be really good to kickstart a, a good community effort. Uh, another thing I found while I was doing research is that there's actually a NetX YouTube channel. Uh, I didn't know about this one, uh, but it's one of the main developers, has a bunch of intros and tutorials and descriptions of features inside NetX. <laughs> So if you're just getting started with NetX, this is a great place to go and, and uh, learn some things about uh, the operating system. Uh, so, so NetX, I think, is uh, actually starting to get some momentum. And I mean, it's been around for a long time. It's been used in several places successfully, including in some Sony products. And so uh, it, I think it's good for it to uh, start getting some promotion and, uh, for lack of a better word, marketing, maybe. <laughs> And uh, build up the uh, the community and the ecosystem. If so, some of that, you that's, have that's some interest good. about this event, please let me know, and I will be able to tell you about the detail. Mostly, this event, any, ah, the Orlando event, any, if you have any interest, you can reach out to me later. Sorry to disturb you. Okay. So, the next one is Zephyr. Uh, this is a uh, this operating system it was originally promoted by uh, Wind River and Intel but it was adopted by the uh, Linux Foundation I couldn't find much recent news about Zephyr I did find uh, this thing from last year talking about how they had added some memory protection which is a little bit different a lot of these low-end RTOSs so both NUTX and and Zephyr and free RTOS are intended to be in in kind of lower end devices including devices that may not have memory management units um, so but Zephyr gained memory protection. The other thing I saw is that uh, it does seem to be getting into uh, lots of different boards. Uh, the latest boards that I could see that were mentioned were uh, this IV5661, which is a Bluetooth 5 and 802.11ac Wi-Fi IoT board uh, for only 35 bucks. So you can find kind of low-priced boards that uh, are running Zephyr. Uh, and then there's another one that had an e-paper display, VLL. VLE5 and VLE Mesh uh, for $39. So, um, so I think Zephyr is making pretty good inroads in terms of uh, getting onto more devices and more chipsets and development boards. Um, free RTOS, uh, is, I feel kind of bad because this is the only piece of news I have on it. It's a couple of months old, but there were some security vulnerabilities found in their TCP IP stack. Uh, I wish I had some, some positive news, but it's sometimes these uh, RTOS things, there's just not that much news that hits the mainstream press. Um, anyway, so, uh, but these are uh, vulnerabilities in, uh, just in the TCP IP portion of this, uh, of this operating system, and they were addressed, the fixes were made for this. Uh, but this is actually kind of interesting for free RTOS because um, free RTOS has actually a variant of it called, I think, Safe RTOS or something that uh, uh, is intended for safety critical applications, and so it's very uh, it's it's very important to this community uh, that these types of vulnerabilities are found in things. Um, so let's see. So then Android. Android not really a, Android is the opposite of a low end system. Uh, it's a uh, it's not as big as like Windows or you know, but uh, it's it's pretty big these days. Um, the latest Android release uh, out that's out actually in products is Android Pie that was released in August. Um, and it has a few things that are, a lot of the big changes in Android have to do with uh, how the user interface is managed and, and uh, but there are some things that are kind of interesting from an embedded perspective. So it has uh, support for 1.1 uh, of Vulkan. So Android is moving over to um, the new Vulkan graphic libraries. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. We're seeing Vulkan take off in more and more uh, products. Um, it has adaptive battery predictor, prediction, so in the area of power management, uh, it's using, uh, it's actually doing some uh, aggressive hibernation of apps uh, that interestingly the OS determines the user will not use. I'm not sure what the heuristics are there, but uh, so, you know, mobile phones are always really concerned about uh, uh, battery usage and power usage. 
Um, and then uh, also some security features I got into this. One of the, one of the important ones was uh, doing DNS over TLS. Uh, so I can't remember exactly what the acronym TLS stands for, but it's the it's the encrypted layer uh, transport layer security, or something like that. The, it's the encryption for um, for network requests, and uh, so in order to make uh, uh, DNS lookups more secure, they're they're encrypting them, or they have the capability to encrypt them. So that's actually a good thing. It'll it'll keep uh, mobile phones from users from getting to man-in-the-middle sites or hacked, hacked sites and DNS redirection and that type of thing. Um, so one thing I did want to comment on, even though this is a little bit older, so the previous release, Android Oreo, they did come out with a, a release called the Go Edition. And this is actually more than a year old, but uh, it came out in November. But uh, uh, Android Oreo Go is a lightweight distribution. It's, it's uh, this is kind of like an interim release between Android Oreo and Android Pie, uh, but it's lightweight distribution that runs better on devices with less than one gig of RAM. So uh, that's actually interesting. There's uh, there there are still efforts to uh, make Android lighter weight. I, I remember my original Android phone. I had one of the very early editions. I think it was running actually Android uh, Cupcake or whatever. So back in the C. Um, that ran it with 512 megagram, and so obviously it's been a long time that Android's been out there, and they're still trying to keep it down. One gig is not exactly small by embedded standards, but uh, but it's a small by mobile phone standards. Um, so in terms of the Android's relationship to the Linux kernel, of course Android uses the Linux kernel uh, as its core OS. Uh, there's been some good progress made in the early days. There was quite a bit of Android that was kind of forked and was different. Uh, a fairly large patch set that was outside the Linux kernel. Uh, if you look though recently, now this is not super recently, but in 4.14 if you did a diff between Android 4.14 AOSP and the long-term stable kernel that it was based on from the community, uh, you found about 41,000 lines of changes um, and in 432 files. And that may sound like a lot, but it's really actually not that much. If you look at a major distribution of Linux, like Red Hat or Debian, uh, you're going to see actually a lot bigger difference uh, than that between uh, their distribution version of Linux and the uh, stable version it's based on. So Android is actually in really good shape. It's, it's kind of no different than other distributions of Linux. Um, so in terms of how far away it is from mainline, uh, some of the places that these changes are still present is in SD card stuff, NetFilter, the Ener energy aware scheduling, actually some progress was made uh, on that, USB gadgets, and uh, also binder FS. So uh, in the 5.0 version of the kernel, uh, there's something that was mainline called binder FS that has to do with incorporating some of the uh, items from the binder interprocess communication mechanism. Uh, and uh, the group that's been doing a lot of this uh, Android uh, upstreaming is Lenaro, which is uh, which makes sense. They're doing a really good job. Uh, they do a lot of testing of the Android common patches. Uh, so even if stuff is out of tree, that gets tested pretty well by Lenaro. And of course, Google and the companies that are that are working with uh, uh, Android on devices uh, do an awful lot of testing. Um, there was a good talk about the kind of the status of the mainline patch set uh, at last year's ELC. If you want to check that one out. Um, and then uh, there was also a talk uh, called Bringing the Android Kernel Back to Mainline uh, that was done at Plumbers, which uh, is more recent. I think this was uh, October, no, November. November of this year, last year, so just a couple months ago. And there was a good summary of that talk on LWN.net if you want to go look at that. Um, now, Fuchsia. Fuchsia is a low-end microkernel uh, operating system by Google. The interesting thing about Fuchsia is uh, Outside of Google, nobody's sure exactly what's going on with it or why it's there. <laughs> so, if you uh, if you know a lot about Linux history, you know that uh, uh, Linux actually developed was developed by Linus Torvalds to be a monolithic uh, kernel, which means uh, all of the functionality contained in a single single binary, uh, tightly glued together, statically linked together, uh, and that was based on uh, debates or conversations that Linus had had with uh, um, 
with Andrew Tannenbaum uh, about his offerings of stuff, the name of which escapes me. It was Minicom, I think. Um, but anyway, um, so uh, there's been a big debate about microkernel versus monolithic kernels. Well, Google is experimenting with a microkernel now. Um, and uh, it may be that they intend to use this to replace Android. It's hard to tell whether this is just a research project or something they're serious about it. Uh, it's based on, so it's a, it, it's a full operating system with, uh, I'm not sure if they have user space boundaries, but you know, they have device drivers and things like that. Um, it uses something called the Zircon kernel, which is based on LK, which stands for little kernel. LK has been around for quite a while. It's another RTOS that's uh, been used in a lot of different devices. Uh, Zircon has a BSD3 clause license, uh, which is uh, quite a bit more permissive than the GPL. If you want to contribute to it, so you can, if you, you can download the Zircon code right now and use it in any product and not have any legal restrictions in terms of having to give code back or pay money. Uh, but if you want to contribute to it, you do have to uh, agree to the Google contributor license agreement. So licensing is kind of interesting there. Um, and that's, that's okay, uh, that's fairly standard. It's, it's, uh, Google has for a long time been a little bit wary of the GPL. Most of their Android, Android code was not under GPL, uh, the user space code. And so there's some speculation that maybe, uh, maybe they want to get rid of the Linux kernel also as part of Android. So this uses a Vulkan graphics stack, just like Android. Uh, just recently, in January, it uh, developed the capability or was added to the repository the capability for Fuchsia to run Android apps. Uh, so the, um, the command interpreter and, and the package managers and all those, all those things necessary to run Android packages. And it's been demonstrated running on Google Pixel 3 hardware. So is this the successor to Linux in Android? It's hard to say. It would have to get really, really good. Uh, Android, uh, Linux kernel is obviously very, very mature and supports tons and tons of devices. Uh, so we'll have to see what happens with this. Uh, it might be used on Google's own devices. They might not even be making really a public play with this, but more just for their own products. Um, so that brings me to Android Things. This is another Google uh, operating system that was really uh, targeted at uh, IoT, and it was included in a few of uh, Google's own products, uh, including some smart speakers and, and things. But this appears to be dead now. So if I have bad news for you. If you're working on Android things, it looks like Google's dropping it. Um, uh, there, it seems to be deprecated. Uh, in fact, uh, some major publications, Ars Technica and Engadget, are predicting that uh, Google will uh, abandon this particular effort and switch to Fuchsia for its own low-end devices. Um, and so that's too bad for Android things, and, but uh, interesting. You know, Google is big enough they can experiment with a lot of different things. Okay, and then on to the, you know, the big operating system that I always talk about is Linux. And so here's kind of the status um, of Linux. In the last year, we've seen, uh, what, six releases? Uh, including just this last Sunday, we saw the release uh, of Linux 5.0 uh, on March 3rd, and it was a fairly standard 10-week uh, cycle. The, the cycles for Linux vary between 9 and 10 weeks, uh, depending on how many bugs are found. We're currently in the 5.1 merge window, which means there's a two-week period of time where Linus is accepting patches and pulling, pulling patches uh, from all of the uh, subtrees from the different maintainers. So, uh, we don't actually have a whole lot of information about what's in 5.1 yet. We know a couple of things, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But um, I just want to make one comment on the version number. So a lot of people see a major version number like 5, and they think, oh, this means that there's been some big change. There's some compatibility issues, or there's a big feature. And actually, that's not correct at all. <laughs> so Linus just... Linus just runs the minor numbers up until he gets to about 20, and then he switches out, switches the major number, just because he doesn't like super high minor numbers. Uh, there's really nothing special in this release uh, that makes it different uh, than 4.20. You know, it's got kind of a standard set, or it will have a standard set of kind of incremental features. Um, here's some of the stuff that's in 5.0. Um, so, uh, and you can see that it's, it's not, there's nothing huge here. Uh, it's got energy or scheduling 
Uh, and that's uh, a continuation of some uh, pieces that were put in that really make uh, the Linux kernel better for um, devices that run on batteries. Uh, it, there were some year 2038 improvements. In particular, they finished the 64-bit versions of uh, the syscalls that had time fields uh, in order to make sure that the kernel won't fall over in 2038. It seems like 2038 is a long time away from now. Uh, gosh, about 19 years from now. But there are, there are companies who are actually putting Linux in products now that might have a 20-year lifespan. So it's important to get this stuff correct now because you don't want products that are deployed out in the field in bridges or power plants or airplanes or whatever. You don't want those falling, or banking systems. You don't want those all anything to go wrong 20 years from now. So uh, there's actually a lot of work being done right now on this. Uh, the legacy block layer I.O. scheduler was removed, so there's a new block layer scheduler. Well, new. It's been there for a couple of years now, and they finally got rid of the old one, deprecated it. Uh, binder FS, which I mentioned before, which is a backwards compatible file system to support the Android's binder IPC mechanism. And the Adiantum crypto module, which I'll, I'll talk about later when I get to security. Um, a couple other miscellaneous things. So device trees uh, are changing. Uh, we're now seeing JSON schemas for device tree bindings. Uh, this has been something that's been worked on for years. Uh, I can honestly say uh, a lot of um, the current bindings are just a ta uh, English human readable text, and so you couldn't do any type checking on them or validation of them. And so we're switching to a scheme where uh, the bindings themselves, the, the bindings describe the hardware for a particular board or computer uh, where that can be validated to make sure that uh, you have the correct values uh, in the fields. And, and so that will be good. Um, and then finally, uh, the ftrace subsystem, uh, some features were added to add dynamic events uh, to that system. If you look at the contributions for recent kernels, you can actually see that the 5.0 kernel is uh, a little bit less big than uh, other kernels in recent over the last year. So it's had about 12,500 commits uh, versus, you know, 4.19 4 was one of the bigger ones that had 14,000 commits. But it's not, it's not very different. Um, uh, so, you know, it's just a run-of-the-mill kernel that happens to have a new uh, major version number. So, um, and then uh, even though we don't have, we haven't seen the merge window yet closed, so, and I haven't, we haven't seen the articles talking about what's in this release yet. A uh, few things have actually, uh, we know, are already been pulled by Linus. Uh, so they're removing the 8 out format. Uh, they're finally deprecating support for that. Someone, someone looked and figured out that uh, the code that was in the kernel did not actually work anymore, uh, and no one has noticed. <laughs> and, and the tool chains don't actually produce this format anymore. Everybody produces ELF format now. So it's time to deprecate this and remove it. That does mean that if you are uh, have a Linux system that's like 20 years old, uh, you, there may be some binary that uh, if you were to upgrade the kernel might not run. But uh, uh, I guess we'll hear about this if, uh, if, that, if that situation exists out there somewhere. Uh, there have been lots of DRM changes. Uh, so a lot of graphics stuff has been pulled in and some changes to the direct rendering manager. and. And uh, also some additional year 2038 work. Um, and that's really, we don't have a whole lot more information yet. In terms of technology areas, um, this is a list of things I'm going to kind of describe. And I'll just go through each one and, and talk about some, what I thought were kind of some interesting developments uh, that are somewhat related. Some of these, some of these are a little bit tangential, but some of the somewhat related to uh, embedded. So Ubuntu Core. 18 was recently released, I think in January. Uh, this is a stripped down version of Ubuntu uh, based on uh, their 1804 long-term stable release. So some people actually do use um, kind of desktop distributions for their embedded products. Uh, there's actually a lot of embedded products that have a fairly substantial amount of RAM or storage. Uh, this requires 260 meg. Um, which is pretty small by desktop standards. And actually there's a lot of products that, uh, that run in this range. Uh, but the interesting thing I thought here is that one, it's stripped down. Uh, two, 
this is a long-term supported release. So Canonical is promising support for 10 years, uh, which is really, really long for uh, an embedded uh, operating system. And uh, so uh, I think that's if, if, and running Ubuntu, you get, you know, like a lot of uh, features that kind of uh, from the from the desktop uh, stack, you know, you can, I guess this probably has like bash on it or something. So uh, a lot more featureful than others low-end distributions. Another thing in the distribution area I thought was really interesting is Siemens and Mentor. So Mentor was acquired by Siemens, uh, I think, uh, two years ago, uh, are releasing a binary version of Mentor Embedded Linux. So there's been the, a big push over the last, uh, I guess, 10 years to uh, move to Yocto Project to build embedded Linux distributions. And, uh, but, but there are good there are pros and cons to that approach, and in particular Siemens uh, and Mentor uh, are kind of backpedaling on that and going with a, a Debian-based release uh, called Mentor Embedded Linux. Um, and so I don't know if this harkens, if this is indicative of a bigger trend uh, to go with binary releases, but I've heard of several companies that are interested in this. Uh, Toshiba uh, has been doing uh, some work in this area. and. Uh, Siemens and uh, I think one other uh, major company uh, in the industrial space. So uh, this is this is something interesting. We should have seen this coming. Uh, so every time I was at a conference talking to a Siemens person, they were talking about uh, Debian uh, release, and uh, but I didn't think they'd go full binary, uh, which is interesting. Um, okay, so then in the area of graphics. Uh, not, I don't have a whole lot of information here, but this is kind of interesting. So Android has finally, uh, all, of, all of their forked um, graphic stuff, they've finally given up on, well not given up, but they've, they're finally using DRM KMS in the kernel. So for a long time, so when, when Google first looked at uh, the kernel, they looked at the graphics stack and determined that it just didn't have the features that were needed for, to work uh, properly, and so they had moved off and done their own display framework uh, called Atomic Display Framework. And uh, there, so there were these things that were missing in Linux, and it took a while for the Linux community to kind of admit that that uh, their solution was not adequate. And uh, and they worked on features, and in some cases they actually pulled features specifically from Android into the mainline kernel. The two in particular were uh, Atomic Mode Setting and Explicit Synchronization or Fencing. Um, and uh, so both of these are relatively new Linux uh, DRM KMS features, uh, but the Google Pixel 3, uh, which is a flagship product for Google, uh, actually switched over to uh, pure uh, mainline Linux uh, feature set for this, which is uh, really good. Um, and so that's interesting from the graphics space that uh, Android is no longer kind of forked from uh, mainstream graphics. Um, in terms of IoT news, uh, again, I'm not, I don't follow a whole bunch of stuff of what's going on in IoT, but Google has released an IoT SDK for 32 at microcontrollers. So I thought the most interesting thing about this announcement, which I saw it was just in February, was uh, their list of um, operating systems. So Linux was not on the list. So Google is actually, uh, with their IoT SDK, they're targeting uh, sub-Linux operating systems. And uh, in this case, there's uh, targeting Embed, OS, uh, by ARM, Free RTOS, and Zephyr. And so there, uh, this is an SDK that basically it's a set of functions and libraries for uh, doing networking, connecting to their cloud platform. Um, and it's written in embedded C. And you, the library is available on GitHub. I didn't check out what the license was. But basically, the idea is that uh, you're seeing this trend that people are actually um, uh, doing a lot of stuff sub Linux, uh, what I'd call sub Linux OSs. So I have I have I have had a fear for a long time that Linux might get pushed out of the super low end, and I think uh, I think this is a sign that that's happening. Uh, but you know it's open source, so we still get the advantages of communities and and stuff. In the area of languages, uh, kind of just a couple of things on Python, Go, and C and C plus plus. So Python. Python 2 is coming near the end of its life. I think this year, 20, well, no, uh, next year, 2020 is supposed to be the end of Python 2 when it will stop being supported by the Python community. And so there's a little bit of a, 
uh, controversy over what to do about user bin Python. So there's an awful lot of scripts out in the world that start with uh, hash bang user bin Python. And um, people aren't sure exactly what to do about that because Python 2 and Python 3 are not uh, compatible, uh, not 100% compatible. Uh, so people are saying, well, if the distros drop Python 2, should they, do they need to rewrite those scripts? Do they need to just point user bin Python so it loads the Python 3 interpreter instead of Python 2? I'll, in that case, all kinds of things would break. So, um, so there's actually what I think will, is going to happen is uh, Python 2 will end up shipping in distributions for quite a while, quite a bit longer. Um, but uh, so that's interesting. Um, and then Go. Um, Go was originally developed by uh, developers at Google, um, and it's kind of a, a higher-end, more safe language and has coroutines and some modern language features. It's being used in lots of different places, but the interesting thing uh, for this audience is it's being used some, somewhat in embedded. Uh, I've, seen a, I've seen a trend in the last year of uh, Go people using the Go language showing up at embedded events. And at FOSDEM, which is embedded conference in uh, Europe in February, uh, there were two presentations talking about this, Go Tiny for microcontrollers and embedded uh, with Go. So uh, that's a language made possibly to watch and to see how it gets used. Um, so other, other languages, you don't, you don't have to be like a native compiled C style language to work in embedded. I mean, there's MicroPython and, and people have even done embedded projects with Lua or things like that. But uh, use of, and Obviously, people are using Rust and C and C++ in embedded, but Go is kind of interesting. Uh, in terms of C and C++, uh, which is still, I would say, the dominant language in uh, low-end embedded, uh, the main news here is about the tool chains. So GCC 8 uh, was released, and it's actually been released for a while, but this, uh, there's major effort on usability improvements. Uh, provides much better messages for some errors, and in, and in some cases actually shows you fix-it hints. It tells you what you need to change to actually fix the error. So instead of saying just missing semicolon, it can actually, uh, you can pass a command line flag to the compiler, and it will show you where you need to put the semicolon. And in fact, uh, you can even uh, format, have the compiler format those, so those can be automatically processed by like an IDE. So you, instead of just getting errors back, uh, you could get a dialogue from your IDE saying, here, here's what I think you need to do to fix these lines. Um, so that's pretty cool, actually. It does some other things, uh, including uh, finding uh, include files that you missed putting in. So instead of just you know obscure messages about, hey, you're missing you know this uh, pound define or this structure, uh, it'll actually figure out uh, where those things are and uh, give you a hint that what uh, things you need to include. So there's some interesting uh, articles on GCC8 there. I think the one comment I'll make on this is uh, that uh, I, think, I think a lot of these usability improvements are really coming from the competition between GCC and LLVM. Uh, so uh, even if you don't use LLVM, you should be grateful to them for making GCC better. Um, uh, then speaking of LLVM, uh, version 8 was released uh, just recently, I think January. Um, and it has a whole long list of things. Most of the things are really kind of uh, like high-end, uh, other, um, like there's an Intel processor that has some weird instruction sets that are, that are supported. Uh, but the kind of the interesting thing from our standpoint was uh, some of these security issues. So um, it has something called speculatively lo speculative load hardening and bra branch target identification. And that are actually uh, features where the compiler is uh, participating with the hardware to solve Spectre issues. Now, Spectre is a security problem that was uh, discovered last year. And uh, well, it was discovered actually two years ago, a year and a half ago. Um, but the news didn't break until January of 2018. Um, and it's a very, very difficult security issue. Speculative ex execution uh, leaves stuff in the cache that can be detected. And so it's a very, very difficult issue to, to uh, vulnerability to close. Uh, but uh, you're seeing that the compilers are taking this seriously, and they're providing mechanisms to help uh, developers deal with these uh, speculative execution issues. 
and that's very, very important from a security standpoint. Um, in terms of networking, so networking, so we've got Wi-Fi 6 is on the horizon, uh, but Linux is ready for it. Is subsystem support for Wi-Fi 6, which is uh, the, the IEEE name is 802.11.ax, uh, and um, that's been already been added to version 4.19 of the kernel, so 5.0 and 5.1 already have the support. So we don't see a whole lot of drivers yet because the hardware hasn't really made it out to consumers. Uh, but uh, but so we'll see this this networking stack is already supported uh, in the Linux kernel. Uh, Bluetooth 5.1. Uh, I'm not sure what the support is in the kernel, but I just stumbled across this, and it was I thought it was interesting. Uh, so 5.1 will include some new directional capabilities. Um, uh, if you're interested in following in Bluetooth, there is actually some really interesting new features that will be provided by the protocol. Uh, so um, the 5.1 protocol uh, specifies that you can use a um, uh, an antenna array instead of a single antenna. And what that does is it allows you to measure the timing of, of things and you can get an angle to where the device is from the device with the antenna array can get an angle to uh, the object that it's communicating with and vice versa. So a single uh, device with uh, only a single antenna can also get the direction uh, to the device it's communicating from. Uh, so that's really interesting. There's some really, really interesting, uh, everybody's kind of familiar with these devices that are used on keychains. You know, you can put a, a Bluetooth uh, little tile or a tag on your on your keychain or uh, and be able to find it with your phone. But so far, all you've had is proximity, like you're within 20 feet or you're not within 20 feet. This would actually allow you the capability to give direction and distance, so uh, much more precise uh, location services. That's really, really good for a lot of consumer applications, obviously like finding your keys or navigating through an airport or a museum or something, but it's also really good for a lot of industrial things, being able to locate you know, a, a pallet in a warehouse down to the centimeter. Uh, so that's, that's really, uh, really neat stuff I think we'll see coming in the future. Um, and then if, if, uh, if you're like me and you've ever done some uh, protocol debugging, uh, you may be excited to know that Wireshark 3.0 has been released. So this is my go-to uh, product for doing uh, network analysis. Uh, and uh, I've used this uh, pretty much extensively when, I, when I'm doing having network issues with products or devices. Uh, it's being released as an app image, uh, which that's interesting in itself that uh, uh, in order to solve the, the different distributions uh, Different distributions of Linux have different uh, libraries and things, and so a lot more products are getting released as app images and, and instead of as uh, as packages, uh, either Debian packages or Red Hat packages. Um, but some of the features it's got, uh, it's got conversation timestamps for UDP. It's got this feature that allows you to create an Elasticsearch mapping file. Elasticsearch is a full text search indexing uh, tool. And so you can use that to search through your packet logs uh, much more easily. And I thought really interesting is uh, in some cases, if you, if you can provide it some certain information, it will be able to do, uh, decrypt your TLS and DTLS traffic. Uh, so having the decoder being able to decrypt uh, encrypted streams is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, anyway, uh, if you have an upgraded Wireshark, now is probably a good time to look at 3.0 and do something with that. Okay. Now on to security. So uh, in security, the big news is well, this this isn't the only big news, but one of the pieces of news was uh, this anti antum uh, crypto algorithm that was added to Linux kernel in version 5.0. So there's been a, a problem uh, with uh, the security in the kernel, uh, particularly for low end embedded devices, and this is. Um, what people want to be able to do is on their low-end phone hardware, they want to be able to do disk encryption. So they want to keep their, you know, security secrets, their, you know, things like their passwords and, and, uh, you know, keys for things uh, in encrypted storage and, pers and private information or personal files. But on a low-end phone, uh, most of the time the low-end hardware does not have uh, dedicated cryptography hardware. And so pe people have had to do it in software. Well, it turns out that the software just hasn't been fast enough. 
to make it feasible. And so a lot of uh, these really low-end phones have really just gone without disk encryption. Um, so there was, to address this problem, there was an algorithm that was introduced into the kernel uh, about six months ago called SPEC, uh, but that was controversial, some people didn't trust the algorithm, uh, and this eventually got replaced with this new algorithm called Adiantum. Uh, so Adiantum is a lightweight cryptography algorithm, does not require uh, crypto hardware in order to function, and it is supposedly pretty fast. Um, the numbers that I saw were about 11 cycles per byte to encrypt or decrypt. Uh, there's a white paper on Adiantum uh, that's available. It's fairly heavy on the math and cryptography stuff. Uh, but you can check out, it, this is, it looks like it's a well-trusted algorithm. Um, it refers to some pretty well-known uh, cryptography uh, systems and uh, leverages those to uh, make assertions about its own strength. Um, and then, so that's already in the Linux kernel. You don't have to do anything. It's, well, you have to upgrade to 5.0, but, um, and then uh, if you're interested in security, uh, it's really interesting to compare uh, two different approaches. Uh, so the Zephyr OS is an RTOS, and the way they approach security is they have a very reduced functionality footprint, uh, and, uh, and uh, that, you know, forecloses a lot of attack vectors. Uh, Fuchsia by, by uh, Google takes a completely different approach uh, using a microkernel approach where they have uh, different protection domains uh, and, uh, and the messages are encapsulated and, and verified between, uh, between components. So uh, if you're looking at security, it's probably worth looking at these different approaches and uh, to see how security is playing out in the RTOS area. Um, okay, testing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about testing because this is the area near and dear to my heart. Uh, KSELF test is the subsystem test code that's inside the kernel source tree. And uh, this is really the preferred place. Uh, there's not a whole lot of new features here, but the, the uh, basic thing is that this is a stable part of the kernel now. Uh, and if you're testing the kernel, you should definitely be running the KSELF test tests. Uh, it's the preferred place for uh, doing regression testing for kernel features and syscall compatibility. Uh, in terms of recent work, there's been a lot more features uh, or more tests added. So feature-wise, it's pretty stable, uh, but you see some you know, things having to do with uh, timers, networking, net filter code, code TLS uh, have gotten their own uh, subsystem tests inside the kernel. And so this just continues to kind of get bigger and bigger. And the more tests you have, obviously, the, the more coverage you get and uh, more, the better the kernel is. So Fuego is my own framework, a test framework for collaborating on test, infra uh, well, test infrastructure for Linux and tests. Um, so we had our, our news is that we had our big release uh, 1.4 in January. That was, uh, probably about nine months of work, and then we're on our 1.5, trying to do kind of a quicker release this time around, hoping to do something within three months. Uh, but uh, some of the th features that we've already got in development that are on our next branch are support for distributed testing, a change in the way we're doing batch processing, uh, batch tests, uh, combining tests together to make uh, flexible test pipelines. Uh, also, we're continuing to do separation from Jenkins. So Fuego uses Jenkins as its uh, front end for job scheduling and its back end for job visualization or results visualization. Uh, but we've already uh, added uh, some kind of experimental support to do visualization through other back ends, in particular Squad, which is used by Lenaro, uh, LKFT. Uh, and we did some stuff to kind of get closer to what Kernel CI is doing uh, last year. And we've also added PDU daemon uh, support. Uh, so PDU stands for Power Distribution Unit. It's basically a device that you use to control, to turn boards on and off in a lab. And uh, the reason we're doing this is we're trying to harmonize the industry. So we're working with people at Lenaro and uh, people at, um, at other, other companies uh, and trying to, we tried kind of agreed together as a group at our last summit uh, to support PDU daemon, and so we're trying to be supportive of those efforts and and make it so that Fuego and Lava and LKFT and uh, BuildBot and others can interoperate. 
Um, and so that will help us create a test ecosystem. Right now there's lots of little silos, which is bad. Uh, Kernel CI uh, continues to grow and develop. Uh, they recently added support for auto bisection and they have a couple of uh, cases where they actually found fairly serious bugs uh, automatically. So uh, bisecting is when you can run a test and then go through a series of kernel versions or patch commits and narrow down what patch actually caused the problem. Uh, they had a, a few examples of that. They're also adding functional tests for, uh, originally kernel CI was just a build and boot test system, uh, but they have some examples here of some different areas where they're branching into functional tests with graphics, media, power, and USB. Uh, these, are, these are very much experimental for them as they try to figure out how that fits into the rest of their system. The bigger news here than, than the feature advancements are that they're becoming a part of the Linux Foundation. There's a move to create a, a kernel CI project inside the Linux Foundation, and big companies are already investing. Uh, so Google and Microsoft have uh, offered to sponsor servers. And uh, if you want to see more details on this, this was, uh, there was a presentation at FOSDEM, and you can follow this link and uh, look at the presentation and see the status there. Um, and then finally, out in the open source, uh, uh, in the mainline kernel community, uh, there's uh, been a new K-unit test framework, a kernel test framework uh, for unit testing. It, these patch set has not been accepted yet, uh, but it's under serious review by the community. Uh, so this uh, uh, allows writing tests for individual functions to validate that functions, you know, take the arguments and handle them properly, and um, the tests are run in a standalone environment, not in a running kernel. So these are not functionality tests, but they actually are true unit tests of uh, individual functions and assertions and, and uh, checks that uh, the functions behave as intended. Uh, it does not support cross-compilation, uh, so originally I was not too interested in this, but it will, it will increase the um, uh, the functionality or the, the test coverage in the kernel. Uh, and you can read up about this if you're interested in, in this area. Um, okay, and then, uh, I see, is this the last thing? Yeah, so this is my last of my project or top technology areas is the web. So uh, just this week, uh, the W3C officially standardized uh, uh, web <coughs> authentication API called WebAuthn. Um, and this has actually been out there for a while. Uh, it allows for uh, browsers to use a non-password authenticator. So the normal thing is that this is a hardware security key that you plug into your laptop or into your phone. Uh, but it could be something else. It doesn't have to be a piece of hardware. It could be a biometric ID. Uh, so you could use your thumbprint or an iris scan uh, and to get rid of passwords on the internet. So that's really interesting. So browsers have actually supported this for, for months. The W3C is not a very fast moving organization. But they officially released the standard last week or this week. And so now it's official that, that this is a, a way that uh, uh, users can interact with uh, sites on the, on the web without using a password. So the interesting thing for, for uh, um, embedded developers is that uh, if there are consumer products that are interacting with these sites, so say you have a consumer product, you know, it could be something weird like you have a consumer product that wants to directly, uh, like a, a camera that wants to put uh, pictures directly on Facebook, there's going to have to be a mechanism uh, for the user to provide that security hardware or that biometric data or whatever. So it, it, it does uh, change how things uh, operate. Uh, with uh, with the web and uh, put some interesting new requirements on, on uh, consumer product hardware. Um, so you can imagine uh, things like a TV set or uh, a game console, and, you know, just hypothetically there are companies out there that make these types of things, uh, uh, that we'll have to take this into consideration. Okay, so conferences. Um, so some of the conferences we've had in the past, uh, just this past year, you know, we continue to have Japan Japanese like this one, uh, and we had uh, four last year having an open source summit. We had the open source summit in June of last year in Japan, uh, 
at ELC Europe and an automated testing summit, which was a new event. Uh, the ones I want to kind of focus on are more recent events. We had LinuxConf AU, uh, abbreviated to LCA, and we had FOSDEM. So LinuxConf AU, a lot of times I don't pay atten much attention to these uh, conferences because they're really not uh, targeted and embedded. Uh, but this time around there seemed to be a few more embedded presentations. So there was, a, at LinuxConf in January, uh, there was a presentation on how to boot the kernel faster, talking about using Rust, another language choice for IoT, uh, making binary binaries, or very tiny binaries uh, uh, for constrained systems, the bootloader, and then multimedia and automation systems. So, so I don't usually pay attention to, to LinuxConf, but this time around they actually had some uh, kind of interesting comment. And these presentations are online, uh, so you can go look at them and and I don't remember if LinuxConf had the videos online. I know they have the presentations. Uh, but FOSDEM does have the videos online. So even if you could not get to Belgium to go to this conference, uh, you can go uh, look through the, the event talks and uh, go find the videos. Uh, this is really a nice service. So you don't, you don't have to, to fly halfway around the world and, and uh, take a couple of days out of your schedule you want to learn something about some of these topics. And this is just a smattering of the topics I saw there that was interesting. So MicroPython, which is using Python in uh, you know, microcontrollers. Android on Raspberry Pi. Mender, which is an update uh, system, uh, infield update system. Uh, TinyGo, Kernel CI. Uh, in general, there were lots of Go talks, Python talks, talks about uh, using X and Wayland and GPU. Um, so, and then there are, of course, many, many other non-embedded topics. Uh, I have not ever been to FOSDEM. I didn't realize what a huge event it is. They had 720 talks in two days. That is just huge. Um, so, I'm given, I, I'm not positive of this, but it looks to me like it was conducted at a university because they just had a ton of rooms. Uh, so, most of the tracks were, um, uh, they would have a single topic that they had a room dedicated for that. But with 720 talks, that's three, 360 talks per day, uh, probably divided into 36 rooms. So a ton of rooms, ton of uh, talks. So you can, and the event is organized kind of along these topic boundaries. So I just recommend you go look at, uh, at some of these events and see if there's uh, stuff that's interesting. Then looking at what we've got coming up, well, okay, we've got the Japan Jamboree, which is today. <laughs> you guys are at it. Uh, the Open Source Linux sum, uh, Summit in Japan and the Automotive Linux Summit is um, in July coming up uh, in Tokyo. Uh, and so uh, that's something to uh, get on your radar. Uh, if you're interested in the Embedded Linux Conference, this year it's going to be in the fall in August in San Diego. And then there'll be plumbers coming up in uh, September and ELC Europe uh, in October. So uh, a lot of stuff going on in the in the fall. Um, now, just to follow up with just uh, some things about uh, industry news in general. So some of the things that have been going on is the Linux Foundation has a couple of new, um, well, they have one new uh, project and a couple of old projects, some of the uh, news about them. So Linux Foundation launched something called ELISA or ELISA which is a safety critical project um, and this is piggybacking on work that was done by another organization called OSADL in Europe um, and uh, Linutronics which is a, an embedded uh, Linux company in Europe uh, was really heavily involved in this and they appear to be uh, also in the Linux Foundation um, so there's not a lot of information about what they're doing, although OSADL has some stuff on their site uh, about how they've approached this in the past. But safety critical for Linux is a is a really difficult problem because the um, development model is really a little bit a lot looser than you see in other safety critical OSs, uh, and so you can't really certify it the same way. Also, the code base is too huge. Uh, you can't do the types of certification or formal analysis with Linux that you can with other operating systems. So these guys have a lot of hard work uh, to make sh to make these types of guarantees for safety critical systems, but uh, there, there's now a project in place to coordinate that work. In terms of uh, other organizations or other projects, so the Civil Infrastructure Platform, uh, which is the group at the Linux Foundation that deals with uh, 
putting putting Linux in kind of long-term civil projects, you know, train stations, power plants, uh, uh, things like that. Uh, they've announced a new long-term release. Their original release was 4.4, uh, and this is a super long-term release. I think they're they're targeting to support for uh, 10 years uh, at a minimum, and it's got some ma machine learning and artificial intelligence, and it's got the 4.19 kernel, so it's got an updated kernel. Um, and so that's actually pretty good news. They're continuing to make progress. Uh, they also added a new security working group, which is important if you're going to do long-term support. Uh, another project that I that had some uh, some new um, kind of developments was the LF Edge project. So LF Edge is Linux Foundation Edge. It's an umbrella organization for doing edge computing. Uh, edge computing is just kind of IoT computing, uh, where some of the work is done on on the low end on the IoT side, and some of it is done back in the cloud. Um, and uh, so this. Particular project had already had some it, some uh, stacks or some software, a Crano and EdgeX uh, targeted at different vertical markets. Uh, they added a couple of new projects, uh, Project Eve and Home Edge by Samsung. Uh, the one I want, kind of wanted to focus on was this Project Eve. So I thought it was really interesting because uh, Project Eve is doing a virtualization engine for deploying containers out to edge computers. And so that's actually a very different way to approach uh, embedded IoT. And traditionally, for embedded IoT, we've had uh, a kind of a ground-up approach where you develop a single function device, you know, like a, you can imagine a moisture sensor that goes into a, a crop, or you have a temperature sensor that goes into an engine or something like that. Uh, but in this case, they're working on a virtualization engine that allows you to ship uh, different containers out to the edge, have those do something, and send the data back to the cloud. So they're actually treating the edge much more like uh, general purpose devices instead of special purpose devices or single single use devices. Uh, so that is actually pretty interesting. Uh, obviously it requires sufficient hardware that you can do the virtualization and doing containers and that type of thing. And it, and it also implies that there's a whole bunch of orchestration involved there, which is much more top-down instead of bottom-up approach. So uh, I think that's something to look at if you're doing IoT, as uh, people are trying to virtualize your stuff. Uh, anyway. Um, and then automotive-grade Linux just had a release on March 1. Uh, they released version 7 of their stack. And they're, in general, this one includes, uh, uh, notably includes voice recognition and speech APIs. Uh, but a bunch of other features as well. And they also, uh, among other companies, Hyundai has joined AGL. And, and about every uh, four or five months, I see a new announcement from uh, the AGL group talking about a new set of companies that's joined. So they actually have a pretty good roster of companies, Toyota and, and now Hyundai. And I think, uh, I'm trying to remember what other companies were in there. I don't want to mention it unless I'm sure. But I've, um, but they've got a good set of companies and a good set of products that are being based on their distribution. So that seems to be moving along well. Uh, also, in terms of industry news, uh, there's been some change, changing uh, kind of climate on uh, licensing issues. So an awful lot of uh, projects uh, have required CLAs, which are contributor license agreements. Uh, but not everybody agrees that that's a good practice. So the, probably the, the poster child for CLAs is, uh, or the, the group that did it more than anyone else is probably um, Apache. I think they started it. Uh, but, uh, but there are people, uh, including Red Hat, who say that CLAs are not good for open source. And so there's been some challenge to uh, that. And uh, there are people who are trying to make it so that uh, the CLAs are not adopted as much. Um, so I think that's interesting in terms of licensing. And then the other big licensing news this year was that um, cloud providers, uh, people who provide cloud software rather, uh, have been trying to change uh, the license away from an OSS license to something called Common Clause. So Common Clause is a new license that was uh, introduced this year by a company called Redis. And uh, they produce some software that's used in cloud and uh, they were not very happy that other people uh, took that software 
used it in a commercial setting and made a lot of money and didn't really give back anything. Uh, and the reason you can do that is because um, when they say give back, they didn't get back code either. Uh, even though I think originally the software they were referring to had it like a GPL license, which re required code give back. But the, the license issues are somewhat tricky here because usually uh, the GPL terms don't um, kick in until you distribute the code. Well, people who are doing cloud stuff are not distributing the source code, they're just distributing the processing, uh, whatever that code is, is doing. And so uh, the GPL clauses didn't kick in and, and uh, Redis kind of felt like they were getting ripped off. Same thing with MondoDB. Uh, but anyway, they've introduced this common clause license and a lot of people are not happy about it. Um, uh, they understand that there is an issue there, but uh, wish that it had been handled a different way. Uh, it seems to a lot of people like this is a breakdown of uh, open source in this particular area. So it'll be really interesting to see what, what happens with this, how this shakes out. In terms of looking back, uh, there's been a couple of interesting license stories that have happened this year. So Patrick McCarty, who is kind of a noted copyright troll, he's made a lot, he's made millions of euros uh, trying to sue people for um, over GPL violations or that he asserts GPL violations. Uh, but he had to withdraw from a case this year uh, because things were starting to turn against him, so that's actually a good sign. Uh, several companies got together to uh, come up with a GPL cooperation commitment, which gives violators a cure period for GPL and LGPL v2 violations. This is actually a direct response to Patrick McCarty. Uh, because some of the sh uh, things that he was doing were um, were taking advantage of kind of a weakness in GPL2, um, and companies wanted to discourage that. Uh, anyway, the Open Invention Network, uh, this is a group that does, uh, does patent portfolios to protect open source. They continue to do good work. The OpenSSL completed a license change after three years of work. This is the argument in favor of uh, contributor license agreements that you don't have to take three years to change the license. Uh, if one one entity owns all of the uh, has the has the uh, agreement from everyone involved that they can control the license, you can do it much quicker. Uh, but uh, they actually did complete a major project, was able to complete a license change, and that's pretty hard. Uh, in the U.S., we had some bad news that Google's use of uh, the Java APIs was uh, redeclared bad again. Uh, a lower court had decided that their use of Java APIs was fair use, and a, and a higher court, uh, over, uh, Court of Appeals, overturned that decision. Uh, so that's actually really good, bad. The decision is bad uh, for API reuse. It sets a, a bad legal precedence in the United States. Um, and then the introduction of the Common Clause License by Redis Lab that I, that I talked about already. Uh, in terms of uh, some things that are going on in the industry, some big changes. So Microsoft acquired GitHub. So that is really interesting. Microsoft, oh, and just, I just saw an article today that uh, Microsoft released the source code to calc the Windows calculator as open source. So there you go. Microsoft is a full believer in open source, uh, at least for their calculator program, um, and probably for a lot of their cloud stuff. <clears throat> but um, and then uh, Wave Computing uh, has re released the MIPS. They're the ones that strangely ended up with the uh, the IP for the MIPS uh, architecture. Uh, they released that as open source this year. Uh, we're seeing so MIPS was released as open source. Uh, we see RISC Five, which is an open hardware, uh, basically open source uh, architecture for uh, processor. Also. Uh, seeing a lot of adoption, in fact, Western Digital published the source code to um, so to some of the chips that were in their products. Uh, so they've released their designs for their chips, which is really interesting. So we're even seeing uh, the open source movement is not just software anymore; it also applies to hardware. Uh, and then IBM acquired Red Hat. If you're a Red Hat stockholder, this is really good news. Um, so uh, anyway. Uh, let's see, so that is pretty much what I've got. <coughs> Where I get my stuff from is uh, a lot of different uh, online magazines and journals. Uh, the top uh, top ones are listed here, lwn.net, linux.com, 
Linux Gizmos, Linux Journal, Pharonix has actually got some really good stuff. Um, I'll just make one comment about LVMVM.net. Uh, it's a great resource in the community. They have tons and tons of material. If you're not a subscriber, you should subscribe. It's worth the money. Um, so some of the and it's not it's not because you can't get the material because any all of the material that uh, LWN.net writes is available for free to the public. Uh, but if you're a subscriber, there are some articles that are paid paywall articles that uh, are delayed for two weeks. So anything that's older than two weeks, you can see for free. Uh, there are actually some of the links that I have in this presentation are since they're fairly new news within the last week or two uh, that those links may you have to either subscribe or wait a couple of weeks to read them so if you hit that paywall I apologize but uh, you should be a subscriber uh, anyway so and then of course Google gives me lots of information as well <laughs> as I browse around the internet anyway um, so that's kind of the status of uh, the industry and some of the interesting things that I think are going on uh, relative to embedded um, and hopefully you found that interesting and uh, useful for whatever projects you're working on. So are there any questions? So I had mentioned that I don't like much, so I'll try to talk about it. Okay. Just a moment. Yeah, I'm going to talk about it. Uh, so I will share uh, additional information about uh, LLVM8. So, えっと、趣味、僕趣味の時間にLLVM8を1つ使っていて、まあなんかあの、ここで説明されてない便利な機能が、便利な機能というか、追加された機能で皆さん嬉しいかもしれない機能があるので、まあ紹介します。で、そう
I should actually probably go download it and see. <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. And I'd like to add one more information about the goal. Uh, that is uh, of the uh, Japan Jamri 64, that about one year ago, uh, Mr. Kobayashi, uh, whose nickname is Kumikomi no Hito, uh, the, uh, the person of the embedded, uh, make an uh, you know, introduction of the goal to be used for the embedded system. Um, uh, that is uh, recorded in the, on the uh, video and released on, the, on, on the YouTube. And you will be able to look, it into, you look into it. And maybe uh, you will be so much excited to see Go uh, to be used for the embedded system. えっと、あの、日本語でも言いますけど、あの、去年のあの組み込み系でゴーを使っていましたっていうプレゼンテーションしていますこれ結構参考になると思いますのでぜひゴーに興味がある方は見ていただければと思いますアイビリーダッテスジャパンジャンブリー64回目だと思いますいますいますオッケー